What's going on everybody? So the thing that I love so much about these Monday videos is when I ask questions to everyone, it's an opportunity to learn from the wealth of collecting knowledge in the community. You know, I've said many times, I I have not, I am not a person who knows anywhere near, I know so little compared to the total volume of information in the card community that why not find opportunities to learn from each other? So asking questions to you allows me and others to learn from something that others know. And what could be better than that? Again, the whole point here is to be a forum, to be a location, to be a hub really of knowledge and sharing and enjoyment of this awesome hobby. And sharing our knowledge and learning from each other is so on point with what this channel, my channel, our channel is really all about. You know, I've said this many times, I'll continue to say it. This channel is not about me. This channel is not about my card collection. It's not about what are Greg's pickups? What does Greg know that he can share with all of us? This is about our card collecting. This is about what are you guys picking up and what am I picking up? It's about what do you guys think is important and what do I think is important? It's about the community. And that's one of the main differences between the channels that I watched for a long time before I started my channel and this channel is it's a place for us to enjoy together. So it's certainly not Greg's channel. It's the Midlife Nation's channel. It's where we all can congregate. And I'm going to stick by that and every decision that I make and every segment that I do is really revolving around this. How can we help each other? What are some concepts and ideas? Sometimes it's me having a thought, sharing it with you, seeing what you guys think. And sometimes it's you guys having thoughts, sharing it with all of us and hearing what everybody's response is. And that's kind of what we're doing today. Now, if you remember back to last week's question, I had just interviewed Ray from Philly. And Ray is the, the person who oversees the Baseball Card Hall of Fame. And every year when there's a ballot, people vote and some make it into the Baseball Card Hall of Fame and some don't receive enough votes to stay on the ballot. As a result, every year 15 cards are added to the next year's ballot. And Ray is always asking, what are some cards that aren't on the ballot, that aren't in the Hall of Fame, that you think should be? And that's what we're talking about here. I asked all of you, why did I ask you? Because A, I'm curious, and B, because I'm gonna have Ray watch this so he can get some ideas of some possible candidates to be on next year's ballot. So literally, by sharing your thoughts, not only are we sharing some really cool cards with each other and sharing uh, cards that we feel are important with each other and why we feel it's important, but we're literally giving suggestions to the curator of the Baseball Card Hall of Fame to potentially have cards hit the ballot and maybe get entered simply because all of you took the time to share your thoughts and what cards you feel belong. So we've got several people wrote in, several people had multiple suggestions and recommendations. There's some overlap. Several people nominated cards that other people nominated as well. And a couple of the cards that were nominated that we're about to see, I had never even heard of or been aware of. So it's anything from a card that most of us are familiar with to a card that I certainly didn't even know existed. So let's take a few minutes and let's look at what cards all of you are recommending for next year's ballot. Let's check it out. Next year's ballot should include Kurt Buckvacqua's 1976 Tops Bubblegum Blowing Card. 
I mean, you look at that card, and I get it. I get why that would be a memorable card, and a card that people would say is special. You know, somebody was joking the other day, what about the San Diego chicken card? And and it was, you know, a laugh. And then I was like, actually, <laughs> what about the San Diego chicken card? That's a pretty cool iconic card, wasn't it? Carrying over my comments from the Hall of Fame video, the first card I'd like to see is the 1948-49 Leaf Joe DiMaggio, an iconic card of one of the game's best. The second I'd like to see is the 1949 Bowman Larry Doby. Being the first African American in the American League, and having enduring many of the same hardships Jackie did, I believe he's underappreciated in the game and the hobby alike. I mean, these are two spectacular cards. The Joe DiMaggio is one of the cards on my list when I went out to Strongsville. I was hoping I would find one that fit my collection. I didn't. It will remain on the list. I think it's a fantastic card. And the same with the Dobie. When I showed some of the inventory that Ash was going to be bringing to the Strongsville show, he had two of those, and one of them just was fantastic. And I really considered making a play and buying it. It's a great card. Two cards that should appear on next year's Baseball Card Hall of Fame ballot? Only two? There will be 15 open spots. I am limiting my response to eight cards. One, the 1952 Tops Jackie Robinson. Two, the 1948 Leaf Joe DiMaggio. Three, the 1954 Red Heart Mickey Mantle. Four, the 1951 Bowman Monty Irvin Rookie Card. 5. The 1949 Larry Doby rookie card. 6. The 1928 Harringtons or Yinglings or Tharps Babe Ruth. The 1920s are not currently represented in the Baseball Card Hall of Fame. This Plain Days Ruth is the poster boy for these historical significant Prohibition era ice cream cards. 7. The 1975 Tops, number 564. Kurt Bakova, Topps Bubblegum Blowing Kit Champ. And 8, the 1975, number 407, Herb Washington Rookie Card. Pinch Runner Card. It's a Pinch Runner Card. The first and only ever. Now, two of these cards, uh, you know, I had on my suggestion, so I obviously agree with the Jackie, and I obviously agree with the DiMaggio. I think the Ruth is a great call. The, the fact that there are four mantles in already and one of them's not the Red Heart is, is tough because that card is such a beautiful card. And, you know, the Doby already mentioned, the Monty Irvin, I have one, I absolutely love it. And those other two cards, I mean, they're quirky, I, I get it though. Always love the videos, Greg. Thanks for keeping us coming back. The question presented is a difficult one, as I am currently pondering myself as I am working at accumulating some of the iconic cards that I remember from my youth that seemed unattainable then, or I had lost for some reason or another. While many are already represented in the list, there are a couple that spring to mind. The 1969 Tops, Reggie Jackson, and the less renowned, except for a short period, 1983 Tops, Daryl Strawberry. Both had their heyday in the hobby, but still retain some relevance even today. Now, I thought that the Reggie Jackson was in. I'll have to go back and look at the list. Um, the Daryl Strawberry, I totally get. I mean, if you were collecting cards in the late 1980s, that was a big chase card. I mean, Daryl was unbelievable. And this is back when those traded sets were, were huge. And that was really the Grail Strawberry card. My brother was a big Strawberry fan, and he wanted that card for years. Great Q&A, Greg. I liked hearing the community's thoughts on Golden Age versus pre-war. For next week, I think the 1952 Topps Jackie Robinson should be on the ballot because it's the most iconic post-war set card for the most important player in baseball history. Plus, it's a stunning card. 
I also think the 49 Leaf Joe D should be on there too. It's a great looking card and Jody's first post war card. And like the Robinson reasoning, it's one of the most iconic sets of all time. Now, my guy Darren, you guys know I love Darren Return to Collecting. He's got such a fun channel. And yeah, I mean, Darren, I can't disagree. Both were on my recommendation list. I mean, you could make the argument that that is outside of the leaf, might be the most iconic Jackie card. And then, like you said, the the only DiMaggio post-war playing day card. Uh, two super important cards, but also from super important sets, too. Two of my many cards I'd like to see on the ballot are the 1962 Tops number 18 Manager's Dream with Mantle and Mace. Two of the greatest on one card. And the 1952 Stan Musial Redman NL16. The stern, determined look makes this a great card. Now, I heard a few other people mention the Manager's Dream card, and of all the combo cards out there, that might be my favorite. Two of the all-time best, a beautiful photo, an iconic set. Totally think that that should be on the shortest of short lists to go on the ballot. And the older I get, the more I really like those Red Man cards. Um, you know, they have beautiful artwork. There's a, a paragraph of information. I think the Musial is a great choice, too. Two cards I would like to see on the ballot in the future are the 1958 Hires Root Beer Test, Willie Mays, and the 1954 Red Heart, Stan Musial. Two very important and beautiful cards from the very popular oddball sets. Now, I know some people hate the term oddball, and, and I get that. But this, this root beer card is a beautiful card. Uh, the background color, I think, is awesome. Makes the image just pop. Now, the image shown doesn't have the tab attached, but it has become a more popular card recently. And then the Red Heart set is, is a gorgeous set. And this is at a time where Stan Musial didn't have tops cards. And, and the red background color match thing going on it makes this a really cool Musial. Concerning the Card Hall of Fame, definitely the 52 Jackie Robinson. The other one that comes to mind is the 1953 Bowman Color Stan Musial or Warren Spawn. Those are two of the prettiest cards ever produced in my opinion. That set's photography is the best of any vintage set in my opinion. Now, we see the Jackie again, and, and I'm sure Ray is going to watch this. And when he does, I hope by now he, he hears Midlife Nation loud and clear that we want that 52 tops Jackie on the list. Now, when 53 Bowman cards are talked about, one of the coolest cards is the usual. I mean, obviously, the Pee Wee Reese gets a lot of notoriety. But the Spawn, like it's mentioned, and the Musial are two absolutely beautiful cards. I think that Musial is a great choice as well. Okay, two cards to be considered for inclusion on next year's Hall of Fame ballot. Number one, the 1952 Tops. Number 129, Johnny Mize. And two, the 1964 Tops. Number 136, Koufax Strikes Out 15. As to why? I think the cards speak for themselves. Now, a few months ago, I did a what do you think the most beautiful card of all time question on one of these Monday videos. And, and I remember one or two people said the 52 tops Johnny Mize. And I get it. It is a cool card. It's in landscape instead of portrait. Same with the Koufax. I mean, some of these highlight cards and magical moment cards have kind of been off the radar for a long time, but I feel like as people are doing player runs, they're starting to kind of re-enter the mainstream. I would add to the ballot the 1952 Tops Jackie Robinson and the 1953 Bowman Color Musual. I chose the Robinson because I think it is his most attractive card. It appears in the iconic 1952 set and he is the player who has arguably had the greatest impact on our culture. I chose the Musial because it is a beautiful image and because he was not only a magnificent player, but also a wonderful person. It's so cool that two people nominated both these cards. It says a lot about them. 
And to make a comment about them, usual being a great person, you know, if you're not aware of what a great guy Stan Musial was, look up, Google the Bob Costas interview and speech at Stan Musial's uh, funeral. And it, it really gives you some insight into what a great guy he was. I would vote for the 1971 Tops Roberto Clemente. Also would have voted for the 71 Thurman Munson, his second year card, had it not already been voted in. I think these are the two most iconically linked cards to that set. The 3D Clemente is a rare card, but the 71 is also iconic, probably both more well-known and attainable. The card has a great and strong-looking memorable image. It is probably one of the most collected cards outside of his rookie card. Popular among both vintage collectors and Clemente collectors, too. I am kind of surprised it wasn't on the Sports Card Hall of Fame, honestly. Since the Munson is not eligible, I'll stick to the manager's dream 1962 tops, Mantle and Mays. When we think of the golden era of baseball, Mantle, Mays, Aaron, Clemente are arguably the four guys. There are a few others. We could debate, too. For the conversation, I think it's a great card, which has two of those all-time great players on it. Now, if you ask a lot of Clemente fans what their favorite Clemente card is, most would say the 71 tops. And being such an important player, and that set being so important, I totally get why the 71 tops Clemente would be nominated and potentially on the list. And again, seeing the manager's dream card, as was mentioned earlier, you know, combo cards have kind of gotten a back seat for a while. And now they're not as much, and this one is a top tier. The 1971 Thurman Munson card and the 1975 Johnny Bench card should be in the Baseball Card Hall of Fame. Now, as was mentioned earlier, the, the Munson is already in, as it should be. It's an iconic card of one of the all-time great catchers and people. And the, the Bench, that caught me a little off guard, the 75 Johnny Bench. Now, it is a cool card. You know, if you put that side by side with his second year, the 69 tops, similar pose, but several years later, it would be interesting. Weren't those some awesome suggestions? Now, there was a lot of overlap. The 52 uh, Jackie Robinson, that seems like a lock to make next year's ballot, right? I think the 49 Leaf DiMaggio is a very strong candidate, too. And several people also suggested that one. But some of the 53 Bowmans make total sense. Some of the Red Heart cards that were mentioned totally make sense. There's so many great cards out there. But a, a Pinch Runner card? Didn't know it existed. Now, the, the Bubblegum card... I don't even I don't even know who that is. I mean, maybe maybe he was before my time or what. Not super familiar with that guy, but the fact that two people recommended it is amazing. It, it just shows something. It shows that other people are well aware of that card. Now, once I saw the card, I went, "Oh yeah, I, I've seen that before," but. It, it's, it was deep, <laughs> it was deep, deep in the bowels of my brain, with, just covered with just inches of dust. And, and somebody mentioning it, and then looking at the picture, I'm like, oh yeah, okay, I have seen that before. So I think it's super fun. I love this topic. I love the topic of talking about cards that we all think are important and that we like, because it kind of puts it on our radar. Some Hearing so many people talk about some of these cards, I'm like, yeah, man, I really do need that card. Now, does that mean you guys are influencers and you're influencing me? Or does it just mean we have similar taste and some of the things that you think are cool, I also think are cool. And talking about it and seeing it and studying it and hearing about it makes me that much more likely to purchase it and acquire it and add it to my collection. Now, 
that was fun. And I wanted to change gears a little bit for next week's question. See, I recently shared some of the cards from my vintage football card collection. My question to all of you is, do you think that there's any chance that vintage football cards could, not will, but could eventually compete with vintage baseball cards as sort of the king of sports card collecting. We, we all know that baseball cards, as things stand, are far and away the most popular, the depth of cards, the breadth of cards, the number of collectors. But could there come a time where the interest, if we were pulling people as they walked into the national? Hey, what are you here looking to purchase? What types of cards? Is there any chance that football cards could start to encroach as the top of the pack? Now, some of you would say flat out, no. And some people would say, maybe. And some people would say, yeah, I think that's very possible. I'm curious on your thoughts because... I got to admit, a couple of years ago, well, a year and a half ago when I started my channel, I had more vintage football card episodes than I have recently. And they didn't get nearly as much interest as they seem to be getting now. Now, that's clearly just anecdotal evidence, but it does kind of seem to me like there are more and more people that seem to be more open or interested in or considering moving towards vintage football cards. Is that still an overwhelming minority? Or could it be more people than we realize and the demand for vintage football cards is maybe on the rise? That's my question for you because I'm genuinely curious. What do you guys think about the future of vintage football cards. I really look forward to circling back with you on that one next week. But don't forget two things. Number one, today is the last day to make your submission for this month's Midlife Community Show and Tell. So if you wanna upload your favorite pickup from the month of April, today is the deadline. So down below in the description, I'll have a link to the Google form where you can answer a couple of questions and upload your favorite pickup of April. Also, don't forget Friday. This Friday, this is when we're going to have the first real live stream, interactive live stream. Now, I've got several guests that are going to be joining me. I don't want to announce who they are yet. I will, but I have several guests who will be joining me for a variety of reasons, and I'll be telling you all about that on Friday. Also, I've got a pretty cool announcement, I guess you'd call it, that I'm going to unveil during the live stream on Friday. So I hope that you all come and celebrate the 5,000 subscriber, the 5,000 people in this community that we have come together to build this awesome location to share our love of cards. 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, this Friday, May 17th. I really hope you'll join us. See you there.